Okay, good evening, and uh, welcome to this uh, special event, um, the book launch of Kieran LeGrice's new tome, The Lion Will Become Man, Alchemy and the Dark Spirit in Nature. Uh, and as you know, I'm Glenn Slater, and I have the privilege to introduce Kieran, and um, I've not uh, read the book, but I'm really looking forward to hearing about it, particularly the meaning of the title, The Lion Will Become Man, and Kieran promises to reveal that uh, little secret to us. So um, just the the outline is, uh, after I say a few words, we're going to hear from Kieran for about half an hour or so, probably... 10 minutes for Q&A, the bookstore across the other side of the lobby will be open. And so if you'd like to go get a copy there and bring it back, and Kieran will be here to sign copies. Um, some of you probably know that Kieran got his uh, MA and PhD from CIIS in, in, from the uh, department um, of philosophy and religion and in philosophy and religion. And, you know, each of us uh, who are faculty in the program brings something different. And what Kieran has brought to the program is this emphasis in the transpersonal. And that, of course, extends into the cosmological. And uh, so uh, one of his um, interests is in astrology, synchronicity, and of course he teaches that for us. Um, and he just has this marvelous way of connecting the dots and, right, and giving us the big picture and bringing in the alchemy and showing us how these cosmological patterns are related to the individuation process. Um, I've gotten to know Kieran, not just as a fellow faculty member, but also as a, a co-chair. Kieran now has been for 10 years, uh, nearly a decade, um, either chair or co-chair of the program, which uh, is extraordinary. Um, and he has this way of being extraordinarily friendly about anything, even if it's difficult. <laughs> and I don't know whether it's uh, just the British thing or uh, it's just uh, Kieran's personality but that's always impressed me. And um, so he has this uh, cool headedness when it comes to um, uh, catastrophes. <laughs> and as a co chair, that's a, that's a valuable thing. And I have certainly valued his um, interpersonal skills and his insight and his uh, remarkable intuition around uh, many things. Um, he is a prolific writer. Um, this is his sixth uh, book as a sort of standalone manuscript, following the archetypal cosmos, then discovering Eris, the rebirth of the hero, archetypal reflections, and archetypal cosmology and depth psychology. Um, even though I haven't read this book, I've he heard Kieran talk about it, and it's already outstanding in that there's not a lot of Jungians who write about their own process. Right. Um, they write about their patients, right? They write about historical figures, Um but I, in my experience, could count on one hand the number of volumes where 
analysts, Jungian scholars, actually write about the individuation process in terms of their own lives. And as I understand it, this is about a very intense chapter in Kieran's own individuation process. So I'm really looking forward to reading this book um, and more immediately looking forward to tonight. So let's all welcome Dr. Kieran LeGrice. Thank you, Glenn, for the uh, generous introduction. I think 10 years of chair accounts for why it takes me so long to, to write books, uh, otherwise engaged. Because this one I began was probably, um, I don't know, it's at least five years, maybe more in the making. And I, I find myself writing on multiple books at the same time, rather like you perhaps, uh, writing term papers. And sometimes you're drawn to one and sometimes to another. So it's been an ongoing project. It's been part of my life for many years. And it's always uh, a strange feeling when you finally release a book and you kind of let it go into the world. And it's been part of you. And I think as soon as you do that, it becomes somewhat more objective. And perhaps especially so in the case of this book, but it, as Glenn said, it's a very personal book in many ways. Uh, if I'd been calm as chair, then this reveals my pathology uh, beneath the, the, the surface calm. Uh, and as Glenn also said, it, it pertains to a period in my life, uh, 2001 to 2004, where I went through uh, what I describe as a transformative crisis. Um, so really, that's, that's the central topic of the book. What, I, what I'm going to do is talk you through its genesis, its origin. Uh, I will say a little bit about the writing process, because I think that's interesting to, to all of us here. Um, then I'm going to focus on the title, and I, I will explain to Glenn and to you all what the lion will become man means. And it doesn't mean that I've become a lion yet, at least, uh, as, as may be evident. Uh, so I'll talk about the title, and that will be a way to reveal the content uh, of the book, I hope. Then I'm going to say a few words about my aims in writing the book, what, why I was motivated to uh, put my personal experience uh, into written form. Okay, so um, the genesis of the book. Well, it, it began, as I said, when I went through a transformative episode in my life for it's about a three-year period. Um, before I was a professor of psychology in a previous life, I was a computer programmer. And I'm sure many of you here have been through these kinds of transitions where you find yourself perhaps in, in the wrong profession or you stay too long in the wrong profession. And I think that's what happened to me. Um, so as I explained in the book, I early in life, really, when I was a teenager, when 20 years old, perhaps, I had a series of powerful spiritual experiences. That was the time in my life when I really woke up spiritually. And so naturally, having had those kinds of experiences, I wanted to, to work in the field. I wanted to serve my spiritual calling. And for me, that meant young, Jungian ideas, transpersonal psychology, depth psychology. That's what I really wanted to do. Um, then I, in 1999, when I was 27, I think, 26, 27, I uh, went traveling in the US. I'd lived all my life to that point in the UK. And I went traveling with my girlfriend, now my wife, um, and we went to the Western States and California. And I knew then that I really wanted to be in, in California. I wanted to be in San Francisco. I, I, I knew that too. Um, so that was my, my aim, my aspiration. I knew the area I wanted to work in. I knew where I wanted to be, but I, I couldn't get there. I just, I just didn't have the financial means. I didn't have visas to be in the US. So having been through a quite exhilarating exposure to life on the road in America, and having had these very powerful, formative, spiritual experiences earlier in life, I found myself frustrated by my circumstance. I was working in an office. Those of you that know me will recognize immediately that it's not really a uh, a suitable environment for me, and I felt very hemmed in, very frustrated. It seemed to me that the job that I was doing was kind of pointless. 
And it, what happened was I had this tremendous life passion, this drive to do what I wanted to do, but, but I couldn't, or I, maybe I wasn't willing to act on it. And so I suppressed it. I ignored that uh, craving, that yearning, and kept going into the office day after day, engaged in these mundane tasks. Well-intentioned, you know, I was trying to save money uh, to do what I wanted to do. But it got to the point in late 2001 where I became uh, sick. Uh, just I had a kind of virus infection, and, and I'd had these before in my life, and you know, moved through them, worked through them. But this one, it really it triggered in me the realization that I I, I couldn't make myself get well. I, you know, it's an obvious statement. We can't command ourselves to health, but. It, I got quite panicked because I recognized that whatever I did, there was no guarantee that I could become well and I might die. That, that thought occurred to me. Well, and so I, it was really an encounter with the limits of the ego, we might, we might say in our field, and the limits of our capacity for rational control of our lives. Uh, I, I recognized that I, I wasn't running the show uh, and I know We've all been through that kind of experience here where you recognize the reality of the unconscious, uh, we, we might say in Jungian terms. So that threw me into this crisis and I carried on working in computer programming for a while, but then at some point in the next year, I, I resigned my position. And for the rest of that time through to uh, about August 2004, I was totally absorbed in my own psychological process. And that's the experience I, I describe in the book, how I came to terms with that, how I worked through it, how I managed to reconnect to that passion within me in a way that, that didn't destroy me, because that, that was certainly a danger uh, at the time. So you can read about that in, in detail in the book. Um, in 2004, August 2004, I'd been through the crisis uh, to the extent, I worked through it to the extent that I, I felt that I could resume my life. And so I'd applied to CIES in San Francisco uh, to study in the Philosophy, Cosmology and Consciousness program beginning fall 2004. And it was a big deal for me because I'd been really I won't say sick, but I'd been traumatized by what I'd been through. And so uh, I had, to, I, it was risky. It felt risky to me moving to, to California, 5,000 miles from, from the UK. But I also felt that I, I had to do that. I felt that if I was going to come to terms with this energy within me that I hadn't been able to express in a, in a constructive way, then I, I had to at least begin to act on it. So I took that chance. And then the very first semester at CIES, uh, one of the courses, it was electives in the program, one of the courses I chose to do was uh, called The Alchemical Tradition, taught by a guy called David uh, Alansi. And that's when I first read Mysterium Conianxionis, which, uh, as you will know, is the, the, the last major new work in, in Jung's collected works. And I was just totally blown away because I, I felt that I, I, like I was just reading about my experience. I, I, I still to this day haven't seen any book that approaches Mysterium for its uh, clarity and depth in describing what I, what I understand as a psycho-spiritual death, rebirth, transformative crisis. Uh, so I, I, I knew Jung, I'd been reading Jung since I was 17, 18, and by this point I was early 30s. So I was pretty steeped in Jung, and I'd read Campbell and uh, transpersonal authors, Sagioli, Ken Wilber. I'd read a lot, uh, but I hadn't really studied Jung's alchemical works. I, I think that's often the case in our field that everyone reads all of Jung and they get to the alchemy and it seems kind of obscure. It's difficult, it, it, it's hard to understand. But I read it, I think, at the right moment, and like every sentence was just speaking to me. Um, and in that course, it was, I was in the, an, the MA program uh, at CIS. I, I wrote about my experience in my term paper. And I think rather cruelly, I, on my professor, I wrote like 30 pages. I mean, it was 
you know, an, an unreasonable amount. Um, but it just kept coming and coming. And so I had this 30 page paper that uh, the professor liked and, and, I, uh, and I, I, I used that. I, when I began at Pacifica in 2013, I think I started teaching alchemy in 2014. I used this material in the residential classes because I felt that, I mean, I don't, I don't uh, take any particular delight in talking about my own experience, but I felt it was important to have an example of alchemy that kind of gives it a human face so that people can see the personal relevance of alchemy as well as appreciating the historical, you know, medieval, early modern alchemical treaties. Because it feels like it's of its time, alchemy. You know, the images are from medieval Europe mostly. Um, so, I, but I found, I felt that I'd, I'd been through uh, a, an alchemical light transformation. And I had a series of dreams that I recorded, synchronicities, active imaginations, and I created some artwork that's included in the book or a selection of it. Uh, and, and I'm certainly not an artist, so it's not of any great artistic merit, but it was just a kind of uh, survival mechanism when I was in the midst of my crisis. I was just, just painting and not knowing really what I was painting, and I just created what seemed to me, looking back afterwards, alchemical-type imagery. So again, you can uh, take a look at those uh, in the book. So I had this 30-page term paper, I was teaching at Pacifica, and then um, in 20, I think it was 2018 or 2019, I got an invitation from Murray Stein, who you will know, I'm sure, a prominent figure in, in our field. Murray Stein and Thomas Arts were publishing um, a series of volumes on Jung's Red Book called Jung's Red Book for Our Time. Um, and I sent in an essay uh, to the second volume looking at archetypal astrology and the Neptune-Pluto conjunction. Um, I won't go into that now, but uh, that went well. And I, I thought, you know, I, I would describe in psycho-spiritual transformation and the evolution of consciousness and other such topics. And on the back of that, I then got an invite to do a webinar with, with Murray Stein um, on archetypal astrology. And they, they then invited me to be the uh, speaker of the Zurich lecture series um, hosted by the International School of Analytical Psychology in, in, in Zurich. Um, and part of the arrangement, when I accepted that, part of the arrangement is that you go to Zurich and you give a series of lectures over two days, which I, I just did uh, in September, and you publish an associated book, previously unpublished material. And I didn't know honestly what to publish. And I was gonna write something new on archetypal astrology, but I, I'd been working on another book on archetypal astrology for forever, for like, I don't know, 12 years. And so I didn't really have the energy to start something new on that topic. And I knew I had this alchemical manuscript, uh, which I'd been working on from that 30 page term paper and kind of embellishing it over the years. So I decided that then I was going to publish that uh, for the book. And I was going to talk on my alchemical transformation. And then in the lectures, bring in some archetypal astrology. So there's no astrology in this book, it's just uh, alchemy. So, so that was the, the genesis of the project. Um, it's one of the books that I found the most, the easiest to write. And you, you have this experience in your own writing. Sometimes you get the flow, sometimes, you know, it's more stop start. With this, although I've been working on it on and off and not in an unbroken block, it was just, that the ideas were coming to me. It, it, I felt like it, it had its form. The chapters were fairly clear to organize. Uh, so it was quite a, a rewarding experience to write, where other books I've done have been more of a, uh, you know, a, a labor. Um, so, so I set to work on that and uh, finished it and just published it just, just this year, just a couple of months ago. Uh, and this is a that's how it looks for those of you that, that haven't seen it. Um, so uh, the title, uh, The Lion Will Become Man. Uh, any of you that know the Gospel of Thomas, which uh, is a Gnostic text 
that was unearthed in Egypt in Nag Hammadi, a desert in Egypt in 1945. The Gospel of Thomas is one of the so-called uh, Gnostic Gospels. Um, and I was led to that book quite synchronistically. Uh, I had a dream that I describe uh, in the book uh, where I, I it was quite a strange dream, but I was being chased around London by this Rastafarian guy. And I, I don't I don't know why. And he was like, a, in the dream, it was like a board game. It's a, a bit like Monopoly maybe, but also like Snakes and Ladders. And I was watching the game in the dream. And then I was actually in the game. And this guy was chasing me around London. And I woke and I thought, wow, that's, that's kind of unusual. Um, but I didn't really think of it again. And I went to London about a week later. This must have been 2003. And those of you that know London might have been to uh, a bookstore called Watkins. It's a mind, body, spirit specialist store near Leicester Square. And I, I always used to go there. Every time I go to London, I, I go to Watkins. Uh, so I, and I was there with my wife, we, we went in and it's like two floors and you can go down and it used to be all secondhand on the um, secondhand and esoteric on the ground floor and more kind of popular titles on the plus on the um, sorry on the lower ground floor was the secondhand esoteric so, so I went downstairs and I looked across and this guy from my dream the Rastafarian guy was there and I you know, I knew it in an instant I mean I I don't think I'd seen another Rastafarian anyone in Rastafarian uh, garb in Watkins before or after it was just it was the guy exactly the same so I, I kind of stood there dumbfounded and I thought, you know, I'm not going to go up and speak to him. That would have been, uh, you know, a little foolish perhaps, but I just watched where he was and I could see he was standing by a certain section of books. So I went over, when he left the store, I went over and I just pulled a book from the shelf and it was the Gospel of Thomas. And as it turned out, that book, more than anything, really helped me navigate my crisis and, and understand what I needed to do. I, I felt that it, it's the, the sayings of Jesus, basically. Um, and, but, and it's like uh, the, the, the essence of the, um, the synoptic gospels. It, I don't know if you've heard of the Q source. The Q source is l like the, the essence of Matthew, Mark, and Luke without all the moral prohibitions and no mention of the life of Jesus. It's just pure what to my mind a psychological logia sayings. And I was just reading these logia and just it totally helping me understand what I was going through. And one of them um, is logia in seven uh, goes as follows. Jesus said, happy is the lion which the man will eat and the lion will become man. And abominated is the man whom the lion will eat, and the lion will become man. It's a little mind-bending the first time you hear it, so I'll read it again. Note that the outcome is the same. The lion will become man, but there are two different possibilities that lead to that. Jesus said, happy is the lion which the man will eat. Man eats the lion, and the lion will become man. And abominated is the man whom the lion will eat, and the lion will become man. So basically, you either consume the lion yourself or um, it, it will consume you. That's what I uh, understood by that. But what then is uh, the lion? What does the lion represent? Um, that I, you know, wasn't immediately apparent to me, but I, come to, I came to understand the lion as... I mean, I, kn I knew of the lion in uh, Friedrich Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Those of you that are familiar with that book, will know there's a, a prologue, Zarathustra's prologue, and um, he describes uh, a, a section called on the three metamorphoses of the spirit. Uh, the spirit starts out as a camel, um, and then becomes a lion, and then becomes a child. So I knew the lion in that parable. And the lion there for Nietzsche is a kind of egoically empowered individual freedom that the, the lion confronts a dragon called thou shalt. The dragon's got a thousand scales and there's thou shalt inscribed on each of the scales, which I understood to be a kind of superego, like a, a, a 
moral constraint, the, the, the values of a thousand years, as Nietzsche said. And you need the strength of the lion to empower your individuality to overthrow the values value of a thousand years so you can live your own life. And I felt that I tried to do that in the way that I'd lived, but I I hadn't reckoned on the fact that I then needed to come to terms with the lion. Because if you've got this instinctually empowered, egoic individualism, what then do you do with the lion energy when you don't need that anymore? How does the lion become the child? So I came to understand the lion following Jung uh, as the animal side of the conscious ego. In alchemy, Jung describes it as the king or soul of soul the sun, the animal side of the king. The king represents the like domineering conscious ego, and then in the unconscious as this animal instinctuality, passionate emotionality is another way Jung describes that. And he also compares the lion to the devil and to Antichrist. He notes, the aggressive strength of the lion has an evil aspect. The lion is allegory of Antichrist and the devil. So the lion is somehow connected to the devil. Now, when I was in my crisis, when I was going through my crisis, I, I had dreams in which I came to understand that I'd been possessed by the devil. Uh, it's not, not the kind of dream one relishes. And I remember one particular dream. I, I had an image of myself as an older man, totally gray hair. And I was wearing a gray shirt that I used to wear when I was a computer programmer. And I had this dream, probably 2001, and it's just before I'd gone back to being a computer programmer. It was kind of a warning dream. And in the dream, the devil was there, and the devil said, I will take the man that wears this. And I saw myself in my, my gray office shirt, and it will be a long time before you recover. So I foolishly uh, ignored the dream. <laughs> And, and carried on in my strategic plan for life. I was going to be do computer programming. I was going to earn a load of money. And then I was going to train in Jungian psychology or transpersonal psychology. But it didn't work out that way. And so I was jettisoned into this crisis. And in the crisis, I had to come to terms, it seemed to me, with an energy within me that I understood to be the devil and the lion. In alchemy, the, a symbol that approximates the devil is Mercurius. Mercurius is the god, the god figure in alchemy. And Mercurius is like Christ, but is also like the devil, like Christ and the devil both. Um, so the, the alchemists are focused on the transformation of Mercurius. And there's these peculiar images of a, of a serpent or a Euroborus or a dragon being contained in an alchemical vessel with a stopper in the top being heated and being transformed. And so this is how the alchemists, or one way at least, in which the alchemists portrayed this kind of transformation, which I, I describe uh, in detail in the book. So I came to understand the devil not as uh, an evil energy per se, although it certainly can manifest in that form, but a kind of split off psychological complex that um, was, was kind of enjoying total power was running the show um it, it, it was not related at all to my consciousness and i felt subjected to a tyranny uh, at the hands of that energy so really the book describes how i came to try to come to terms with that devil energy and integrate it and thereby eat the lion and rather, rather than be eaten by the lion but i came to understand also that the only way it seemed to me that one could assimilate the lion energy is if the structure of the ego is broken down and transformed. So in many ways, the book is about uh, a process of ego death, uh, which is a term that you find prominently in the work of Stanislav Grof in transpersonal psychology, but I think less so, or maybe not at all in Jung, not explicitly that term. But in Jung, you will see similar terms like the dissolution of the persona or the collapse of the conscious attitude, which I think are, are aspects, important aspects of this fuller process of ego death. 
And even though the ego dies, and at least in my experience, that is a very real death, death experience. Um, it's not that one then becomes enlightened and egoless, or at least that's not happened to me yet. You know, maybe, maybe it will, but not so far, alas. Um, but one form of the ego dies, and in its place, a refashioned, reforged ego emerges that, uh, as we might say, in Jungian terms, serves the self. And so that, what I describe, a death rebirth process by which the old form of my ego uh, was broken down and a new ego was formed. And at the same time, then, I was able to come to terms with this lion devil energy. So my aims in writing the book, just to, just to finish, uh, I wanted to highlight and accentuate uh, the centrality, to my mind, of the, e of the ego death process in individuation. Because I feel that that's not maybe explicitly named uh, as much as it could be. In a broader sense, I, al I also wanted to understand the transformation of the ego in an evolutionary context as an aspect of the evolution of particularly Western civilization and the evolution of consciousness. So the book, even though it's very personal and psychologically intimate, is also, I think, about everyone's experience. You know, I, I look at uh, the um, conditions in Western civilization and, and view what's happened in Western civilization alchemically and relate the ego's existence to that. Uh, I also wanted to show how one might use a knowledge of alchemy, alchemical procedures and operations and symbols to illuminate individuation. And this is what Jung does in Psychology and Alchemy and Mysterium, Codium Chionis, but I suppose I wanted to do it in a, in a way that seemed more uh, immediate, perhaps, uh, describing it in terms of my own first-hand experience, and also to show that alchemy is not something outmoded, but uh, even though the images may be, uh, the alchemical process is still very much at work in the, in the lives of modern individuals. So I, I hope to illustrate that too. It's a thoroughly Jungian book. It describes dreams, uh, active imagination, synchronicities, a lot of synchronicities, alchemy, as I mentioned, it's littered with Jungian topics. So you're gonna find a lot in there, if you, if you read the book, uh, of relevance to you and, and your own lives and your own studies. Um, I also wanted c to connect in a, in a fuller sense, uh, in a metaphysical sense, to connect personal experiences of individuation and death rebirth to um, the, the evolution or a dialectical relationship between different aspects of the divine. Because I, I felt that in my life, in my experience, I, I'd encountered a transcendent divine, something like a God of love in Christianity or a Gnostic uh, uh, unknown God, um, a transcendent father-like deity. I had powerful experiences of that. But during this time, I felt that I was encountering also uh, an imminent spiritual power, which I call, uh, following Jung in the subtitle, the dark spirit in nature. And alchemy is all, all to do with facing one's emotional instinctual life and liberating the slumbering spirit, the sparks of consciousness and meaning and um, differentiated feeling from within the instinctual sphere, and then uniting that liberated spirit, the eminent spirit of nature, with the transcendent divine. And this sounds very grand, but I, I had um, the sense that that was happening in my own experience, that it was, even though it was acutely personal, it wasn't just about me. It was about the transformation of the ego as a principle. It was about the evolution of the divine in all of us and something we're all in different ways facing, I think, uh, today. So above all, I, I had the sense, even in the midst of my crisis, that if I could get through it, if I could understand it, I could help other people. 
I mean, again, I think this is an aspiration that many of us feel when we confront our own traumas and wounds, that our own insight can then be helpful ultimately to, to others. So really that stirred the heroic in me at the moment when I needed it in the midst of my crisis. I felt like I, I had to get through it. I had to survive. I had to make sense of it. And if I could do that, then uh, I, could, I could help other people and, and hopefully um, help to illuminate uh, their experience as, as alchemy helped me, as, as uh, the Gospel of Thomas helped me. So um, thank you for extending your day to, to come to this book event. Uh, I hope I've piqued your interest in the book. And the bookstore is going to be open, as Glenn said, I think till nine, actually. The guy in reception said he would keep the bookstore open till nine. So if you want to buy a copy, thank you. And I will make myself available to sign them. Um, but before we do that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have about the writing process, the content of the book, or anything that comes to mind. Thank you for your attention. And um, there is a handheld mic, so if you do want to ask a question, if you could just grab the mic, and your voice will be recorded, not your image. Um, and it, it may appear on, on YouTube or something, something like that. Yeah. I still don't really know what the title means. Um, so what... What's the difference between those two scenarios? What happened? Okay, yeah. Um, so I think, uh, I don't want to generalize too much, but I think we're all subject to, well, as Jung put it, a, a subhuman and a superhuman transpersonal instinctual power in the unconscious. Uh, those of you that know astrology might think of it in terms of Pluto or Mercurius in alchemy. And it seemed to me that I, that I have to integrate and live that power, which on the one hand is kind of lower instinctual dark energy. And on the other hand is the source of one's transpersonal higher spiritual aspirations, paradoxically both. I felt that if I could live that in its spiritual higher sense than I could in the lion. I would consume that energy in the acts of life, in being who I, who I was. Uh, so for me, that entailed at the right moment, moving to San Francisco, you know, that the life in me wanted to be free and wanted, you know, happy experiences and wanted adventure and all this was welling up inside me. But I was able to live those uh, you know, lower, if you like, lower aspects uh, in the context of my higher spiritual vocation. Uh, so at least that's what I came to understand by consuming the lion. Um, on the other hand, if I hadn't been able to do that, I had the sense that that energy would have totally destroyed me in my life. And if I tried to live a normal life and ignore that energy and just kind of live up within narrower parameters, I, I think I couldn't have done it. It would have shattered my, my psyche. So I, I had a dream right, right around the time I had the synchronicity and got the Gospel of Thomas, uh, another dream. And in the dream, um, you know, I was in a train carriage and I was there and there was a lion roaming free in the train carriage. And I realized that the lion handler wasn't there. Um, and so I, I got some rope and I bound the jaws of the lion very tightly. But I realized then that the lion couldn't breathe. So I, I then let go. I, I, I took the rope off. And then the lion was running around the carriage in a dangerous way and uh, threatened my pet cat. My pet cat was also in the dream. And as a result, other people had to come and anesthetize the lion. And I felt this sad loss that, um, you know, for me, I think if I resorted to medication at the time, which was a temptation, uh, that that could have happened, that that energy would have just been dissipated and um, the, the, the passion in me, the life energy in me would have gone. Um, so they were two possibilities, binding the jaws of the lion, which I understood as repression, repressing the, uh, kind of suffocating that life or totally abandoning myself to, to the lion, to that instinctual energy, letting the lion roam free. 
they were two uh, polar possibilities. Then I had, in the same dream, the whole scene was replayed in the train carriage. This time there was a lion handler present and it was a woman and she was effortlessly con uh, containing, uh, controlling the lion by feeding it fish. So I woke and, you know, being a good youngie and I thought, well, that, that must be my anima. You know, the woman is the anima. And fish I thought of in terms of Christianity, you know, fish is the symbol of Christianity, Christ, the fisher of men. Uh, so I, it, it didn't really change what I did instantly, but I, I came to understand that I needed to Christ, Christianize, sublimate that lion energy. And I needed to do that through the differentiation of the anima which is a very abstract Jungian way to, to answer the question. But for me, it's a very real process of trying to understand the motivations between, behind each of my feelings. Jung describes alchemy right at the end of Mysterium Corinthianus as the careful investigation of desires and their motives. And I felt that that's what I did to differentiate the anima and be able to control the lion through that uh, through feeling, through differentiated feeling, rather than through binding the lion's jaws through egoic repression. So, um, so that, that's what I mean by the lion will become man. There's another Lockean in the Gospel of Thomas. It goes something like this. If you bring forth what is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, it will destroy you. Something like that which is a similar connotation. So I felt that I had to live that that was deeply within me and eat the light. Thank you. Any other questions? If you could just pass the mic along, that, that would be terrific. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And I... Is it, um, I think it's gonna be... Now it's on? Is that better? Can you hear me? Just about. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to reading the book. Thank you. And I was thinking of Dante uh, when you were speaking, and one of the um, beasts of worldliness is the lion of violence and ambition. And the interesting thing about Dante is he has this sort of twist because, you know, you would associate the the pride that's at the root of violence and ambition. I mean, the sin that's at the root to be pride. But Dante has this kind of twist where he says, no, the, the sin that's at the root of violence and ambition, which the lion represents, is sloth. And then the, um, the kind of the angel that redeems Dante from that is zeal. And so when you were talking about your experience, I really just kind of tapped into that archetype. And I wondered if you could comment on your experience of those polarities of the virtue and vice of sloth and zeal um, in terms of how you transformed that? Well, it's a great question and a great parallel to Dante. Um, I, I mean, in my own dream life at the time, uh, thinking of Dante, the she-wolf is another, one of the three animals uh, with, the, with the leopard. And in my dream imagery, I, it was a savage dog or a wolf and it would become a lion felt like the two were blurred. So knowing astrology, I had thought of egoic pride uh, in the context of the lion, Leo, symbol of Leo and like solar pride, but it felt to me more, less, less, less pride and more just kind of life power that I, I needed to, to express. So, um, yeah, I mean, in, in alchemy, you see the transformation of theriomorphic symbols, animal symbols. And it's as if, and, and, and this was true in my own experience too, you start off with very primitive symbols like a reptile or a serpent or a snake, a dragon, um, representing a very low level instinctual form of, of the unconscious. And then gradually the more consciousness can be brought to bear on, on that energy. It transformed into other animal forms, one of which is the lion, the lion, the wolf, uh, and then uh, moves towards the human form and moves towards flight and birds in, in the way the al alchemists imagine that. So it's something like that for me. Um, I, I mean, partly it was that process of the careful investigation of desires and the motives. That, that's what I did. 
I would sit with an, an effect and I would watch the way that the feeling or the desire wanted to move me and I would resist it and try to get to what was behind like my anxious avoidance or my restlessness or my fears. And I did that repeatedly for over and over again every day for like three years. It was totally exhausting. It was like hypervigilance. But that's how I managed to um, bring consciousness into relationship with, with the feeling level of that energy. So I'm not sure if that exactly addresses what you were asking, but um, that, that, that was my process. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know uh, very much at all about Rastafarianism, but I, I feel like I remember hearing that, that line symbolism is quite important and that the dreadlocks are a sort of emulation of the lion's mane. And I was just wondering if this kind of lion become man of the Rastafarian uh, that first is chasing you and then that you follow had any part to play in I hadn't thought of that. It's a great question, and I, I didn't know that about the lion. But I remember now, uh, in the dream, when I had the dream of the uh, snakes and ladders, kind of Monopoly London board being chased, I had a, a hamster, and I don't know why, but the, the hamster belonged to the Rastafarian guy, and he wanted it back. So I, I don't know, and I, I, I never, you know, I never gave it back in the dream, but that was the, the whole setup of, of the board game. So I, I didn't know that. I'm going to look into that on the lion and Rastafarianism. That's an interesting connection. Yeah, I'll check it out. But thank you. It's a great comment. Um, probably got time for one more question or comment, if anyone would like to. Otherwise, we will um, draw it to a close. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah. Glenn's got a question. All right, it's, a, it's on. So, um, how marvelous that you got to be an ambassador for our program going to the International School of Analytical Psychology and presenting this. And I'm just curious if you've got a couple of sound bites, observations about that experience, particularly in the sense of what I said at the beginning, which is it's a rare thing for someone who's in the field to actually talk about their own individuation process. Yeah. Um, thank you, Glenn. It's great, great question. Um, I mean, I ha I'd never been to Zurich before, so I had that, that you know, projection, that idealization that probably we all have, you know, you go into the, the home of Young, I visited the Young House in Kuznat. But the ISAP center itself is in Zurich. And we, the first night was a formal dinner lecture at a, a, a kind of um, Masonic lodge, like 14th century, very grand, had some connection to Goethe. And then the next day was at another house um, connected to Goethe somehow, somewhere he'd visited. And uh, that was more like a standard lecture hall. But both places were quite I wouldn't say intimidating, but they were um, you know, very, very formal, quite grand. And so I had uh, images of like going into the Jungian world and everyone being therapists. And I, I'm not a therapist. I part of my own path has never, you know, I've never been in therapy. I, I, I was not quite sure. I've been to like six therapy sessions ever in my life. But and yet I find myself chairing, you know, for ten years uh, a Jungian program here. So, you know. I thought that might be a bone of contention with Jungian there, but not at all. Um, and some of the feedback I got were, they, they thanked me for bringing the spiritual more explicitly back into the Jungian world, which surprised me. And um, cause I, I, for me at least, everything Jung does is, is spiritual. Uh, all, all the writing is at root spiritual. Um, but I suppose in a more formal therapeutic approach that might get not get the same attention. Whereas for me, it was very central, very prominent. Um, so I, I thought there were a, you know, a great interest in, in the ideas. Um, 
Yeah, I just I just had the sense that, uh, I mean, I, I did astrology, so that was something new to a lot of people there. And and I think I brought in the spirituals. We're talking about Neptune, planetary archetype. Um, so they, it was just quite an, uh, an eclectic mix of different perspectives. Personal, pe people like to hear, I think, uh, something about personal experience because it gives what can be abstract, it gives it a concrete life. You know, it's the flesh and blood um, struggles that someone might experience. You know, for me, it was very physical. It was, it was somatic. I, I had a lot of physical symptoms for, for throughout the duration of the crisis. It was psychological and spiritual. So I think, I think people appreciated hearing that quite vivid, um, raw dimension to my experience. Even though I, you know, I framed it quite a lot theoretically, I'm not entirely comfortable just talking about myself and my, my own life. So it's more natural for me to retreat to the theoretical. So I kind of, you know, exposing my uh, pathology a little bit. But I felt that's what I needed to do. And, I, and I, I did feel that the combination worked well with the theoretical framing. I was speaking a lot about Nietzsche and uh, the evolution of the ego and then the need for the deconstruction and transcendence of ego in our own time. So I framed it theoretically like that. Then I was able to speak about my own experience in that context and bring in the astrology to, to draw out some of the themes. So. Uh, maybe I left people in a confused state, but it, it seemed to it seemed to work pretty well. Great. Well, thanks so much again, everyone. And I'll be around if you want me to sign your book. Uh, just uh, come along, and I, I will uh, happily oblige. So, thanks again. <laughs>